very experienced uh, budget committee members. So I think they'll be able to catch up with us as we go along. So that being said, I'm going to call this meeting of the budget committee workshop to order and welcome everyone to the second of three budget committee workshops on TVWD's 2021-23 biennium budget. Please remember to use your microphone when, whenever you're speaking and mute yourself when you're finished. This evening's workshop will include a presentation by management focusing on the operating and capital budgets for three of the de district's departments. Before the presentations by the departments, the district's chief financial officer will present a brief overview of the district's financial performance. Because this meeting is a workshop, members of the budget committee are asked not to deliberate and not to make decisions. In addition, the budget committee will not hold public hearings at this meeting. However, we will reserve time at the end of the workshop for questions from members of the public, questions or comments. Members of the public are welcome to submit written comments regarding any of the information presented during this workshop, and written comments should be directed to Paul Matthews, the district's budget officer. So, Paul, I will turn it over to you. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, President Bagnall. Good evening, budget committee members. Uh, thank you so much for your continued participation. After last uh, our work session two weeks ago, we weren't sure if we were going to have full participation, but thank you so much for continuing to help us through this budget process. Uh, just a quick highlight of the uh, issues that we're going to cover tonight. First, we'll have some opening uh, remarks, opening uh, uh, items that I'll go through. Uh, I will then turn it over to Tom who has some comments on uh, guidance that he's given to uh, the management staff in preparing the budget. Uh, and then I'll give a brief, and I say brief overview of financial performance, and in brief in terms of my understanding what brief means, so I apologize if it goes on a little long, uh, but uh, I'll try to keep it as brief as possible and talk about the district's financial uh, performance, as well as our uh, financial strategies we move forward. And then we'll transition into uh, the presentations by the three departments uh, where they'll go over their their budget uh, request and, and their plans. We'll start with the customer service department where our customer service manager, Andrew Carlstrom, will talk about his uh, department as well as the customer information system project that he's managing and uh, the project cumulus as we call it here, as well as a little bit on automated meter reading and some surveys. We'll then turn it over to our chief engineer, Carrie Pack, and Carrie will cover uh, her operations of the district, and uh, she actually she manages quite a bit of the operations of the district, including the water system itself, and then the district CIP. And finally, we'll turn it over to Dave Kraska, our water supply program director, and he'll talk about uh, what's up with the water supply program. Uh, those are the uh, department reports, and then finally, I'll open it up for questions uh, and the next steps in adjournment. So that's our plan for tonight. And with that, we'll get underway. First thing I want to do is to just uh, pause and see if there were any questions that remain unanswered from the last work workshop. We'll either try to answer them now or we'll take copious notes and get back either at the second workshop or in writing. So just uh, real quick, are there any questions uh, from budget committee members uh, that came up from the last work workshop? Okay, hearing none, we'll proceed on to uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, our goals here uh, and just preview uh, what we're what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, first, we want to discuss the assumptions uh, for the operating budgets for the three uh, operating departments we're going to talk about tonight. So this is a work session. Uh, we're not uh, taking testimony and we're not deliberating and we're not making decisions. Rather, we're presenting information uh, that will help us get uh, questions and get questions answered for the budget committee members. So that when you meet in your formal setting at the budget committee meeting uh, next uh, uh, next month, you'll be in a position uh, to uh, to deliberate. So right now, as uh, President Bagnell indicated, we're we're not going to deliberate. We're not making a decision. Uh, we're here to answer questions and to get comments uh, from the budget committee members. So with that, I'm going to turn over to our CEO. Uh, Tom Hickman and Tom will uh, cover some information on uh, TVWD. Tom. Thank you, Paul. Um, 
So one of the things that uh, is, we, we've talked a lot about internally is that TVWD is, is in transition. Uh, we uh, historically were this, as you all know, a suburban water provider um, phase for a number of years. Um, and we, we served water under uh, a wholesale contract um, and managed a very complex transmission and distribution uh, system. But in the it's back in I I wasn't here, so I, I I think it was in the time frame of around 2009 2010 early discussions uh, of the Willamette uh, water supply project began uh, and certainly have carried on, and we are now entering the construction phase of the Willamette water supply program, and this is a pretty big shift for us. Um, we, we, we have uh, massive uh, uh, spending that's going to occur over the next two years and uh, many, many contracts that the uh, project management office is going to be responsible for. And right now it's kind of uh, one of those things where it's all hands on deck, if you, if, if you understand that phrase, um, to help get this project uh, implemented. Uh, and we're going to be shifting in that time frame to uh, moving away from, we'll continue to serve customers from uh, purchased water under a wholesale contract, but we are now actively thinking about and preparing for uh, us actually being uh, more of a regional operations phase. Um, and thinking in that mindset. And so um, a lot of things you're going to see in the budget uh, are aiming us in that direction. It's, set, it's setting the foundation in place for us to be in that regional operations phase. Uh, this is really where we will be serving customers uh, water from the Willamette uh, produced uh, through the, the new Willamette Water Supply Project and through the WIF. Um, we continue to, we'll continue to manage a complex transmission and distribution system that will be even a little more complex. Uh, and then, of course, managing these new commissions, both for WIF and the WWSS. So we're in this transition where, you know, we it was more of uh, really maintaining, uh, providing water supply, moving into the implementation of the Willamette program, and then uh, we are now preparing and setting the foundation of heading into uh, us actually being in the operations phase uh, of that, and all that work is beginning now. Uh, next slide. So um, despite our, our best efforts, uh, we refer to this here as our Rumsfeld diagram. Um, and as a former project manager, uh, this is one of those diagrams that actually brings me comfort, but I know it doesn't bring many comfort. Um, and uh, I, I, I understand, um, but it, what, what was said and what we show in this diagram is actually very true. Um, early on, we have those things you know, um, and, and you know what you're going to run into. And then you also have those things you know you don't know. So in other words, we know we're going to run into some rock. We know we're going to run into utility conflicts. We know we're going to have challenges with easements, um, and we can prepare for those. Uh, but then we start getting into those things uh, that are things you don't know you don't know. Um, so those are uh, what I, I, I've talked with a few of the board members about is um, in my former life uh, working over on the, in Central Oregon area, we had to worry a lot about lava tubes. Um, and my understanding is we have to worry about them here too. <laughs> and uh, you run into that kind of a thing. You just don't know. You don't know that it's there and it can add a lot of cost. It can add schedule delays um, when you run into something like that. But that's still not the ones that really get us uh, nervous. It's those things you really thought you knew. You thought you had it locked down, um, but it turns out you didn't know. them. Uh, so uh, those are the ones that um, scare us. 
And what you're going to see in here tonight is we've done our best to provide and plan for uh, a mitigation um, for these kinds of events happening. Paul, if you can go to the next slide for me. So um, this is a table that uh, I know our board is extremely familiar with, um, and it's one I've been using now for well, at least 10 years, if not 15 years. Um, and what this is, is this is a table that's put out by the Association uh, for the Advancement of Cost Engineering, AACE. And uh, what you see at the very top of this table is what we refer to as a class five estimate. And at a class five estimate, um, we that's early on, that's the inception level of a project. You don't have uh, much project definition. Uh, and the the accuracy of any uh, forecast uh, of uh, expenditure is really in that plus 100 to minus 50 percent. Uh, in my career, I've seen more on the plus side and not many on the minus side. Um, they happen, but it's pretty rare. Uh, but as you move through the project, as uh, we get better definition, our cost estimates get better. Um, but what most people don't realize is even when we get all the way to the point that we have a final design document, ready to bid document, um, we still have uncertainty that is in the plus 15 to minus 10%. When you're talking about a project the size of the Willamette, uh, that's a lot of dollars. Uh, that's a lot of still still a big, big impact. Um, so uh, we've, again, done our best to to try to plan for that contingency. Um, and certainly we hope uh, that bids come in good. But one of the things that has come up even in the last week in discussions I've been in here um, with the talk of the stimulus funds uh, being available for various infrastructure projects with another discussion happening now around this infrastructure bill, um, you know, contractors are seeing a lot, a lot of potential. That may, frankly, more busy and less hungry. Um, and so it can it can create a tough bidding environment for us uh, at a really critical stage of the project. So um, that's one of the big things that I think you're going to hear from Dave and, and we're certainly keeping a close eye on. Uh, next slide. So um, we talked about this at the last presentation we did, um, and uh, I'm not going to go through all these again in detail, but what you're going to hear uh, tonight again is um, almost every one of uh, the, the different departments tonight hit on these on some level, some more than others. Um, all three have pretty big current initiatives. Um, these are ones that we we must succeed on we are we've embarked on them and we must deliver them uh it's kind of that no fail option uh so that's that column that's all the way over on the right hand side but you're going to hear from both uh carrie and uh, i'm sorry chief pa chief engineer pack and um our customer service uh, manager um, andrew carlson you're going to hear from both of them about business intelligence and efficiency through modernization. Um, certainly uh, a lot of the work that Dave is doing uh, uh, on, uh, on the entire uh, Willamette project is there's a lot of intergovernmental relations and relationships that need to be maintained. Uh, so you're going to hear about that. And then across the board, we need to continue our human investment. Um, and that is the, frankly, the most significant resource we have here at the district. Uh, and we need to make sure we're investing in them and bringing them along uh, for the future. So with that, I'm going to turn this back over to Paul. Thank you, Tom. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to go through the financial uh, performance uh, quickly, and that's quickly defined by my understanding of that word. But I will try to 
try to do this quickly because we have a lot on our agenda tonight. And uh, I want to do this by uh, way of uh, recollection. We've talked about this before. It's 12th Valley Water District's financial management process. And I want to give you a sense of where we are. I'm going to talk a little bit about our long term financial plan, not a lot. And, and that is really that cash flow model, 30 year look at what we need to do as a district to fund our priorities. It's that long term strategic document uh, that helps us. Uh, Make sure we have enough money at the right time to build the things that uh, need to be built. It looks at uh, reserves, it looks at bonds, it looks at future rates. Uh, but that financial plan then needs to be consistent with the budget. And so we've we've been working on our financial plan and now we're in the budget process. And the budget itself is a two-year two spending plan. It's, it's literally that very short-term document uh, that uh, guides the district in that two-year period. And so our operating department is going to talk about their plans over this two-year period. Uh, but in addition to that, the budget sets legal appropriation spending limits that the district must follow. So it has that in addition to a spending plan short term. It also is important in that it uh, provides a legal basis for spending and it provides controls over that. The financial plan, the budget then feeds into the rate process, which the board will consider this summer. Uh, which will be again to adopt that revenue plan that uh, is consistent with both the budget and the financial plan and then the last thing of course is to, is the delivery and that uh, really falls on the shoulders of the people that work at tvwd delivering the 7.8 billion gallons of water uh, over 6,000 uh, water quality samples collected all those kinds of things that we do on a on a regular basis as part of our day job outside of that is to make sure that our spending plans align with the community needs uh, and our board of commissioners our budget once adopted to the gfoa to get it reviewed peer review by professionals throughout the country and they provide us helpful advice and uh, help us make our process better uh, each by any and we use that and learn from it uh, so throughout that process uh, our financial audit is another part of that where we have an independent auditor come in and uh, review our, our operations. So that's how we try to keep ourselves uh, uh, accountable uh, through that process. Uh, so we right now, we're in the budget process. And so our goal is to identify those short term spending priorities and uh, to make sure that they uh, align with community values and to hear from our operating departments about that. Uh, when we look at financial performance for the district, there are, there are three things that we currently look at, expenditures, revenues, and cash flow. Uh, at some point uh, in the very near future, we're going to have debt. Uh, and at that point, we'll be looking at other measures, uh, debt service coverage ratios, uh, net leverage calculations, some other things. But right now, our measure of financial performance are those three things. How much are we spending? Are we staying within budget? Um, what are operating expenditures, capital expenditures? And as I said, we have no debt right now. On the revenue side, we want to look at our water sales and other revenues, including revenues from our partners. And then the system development charges, which are those growth related costs that um, help offset the cost of growth and make sure that our existing customers aren't subsidizing growth. And then finally, it's the cash flow. And this is something we look at very carefully right now. But our collections, how are we doing on collecting revenue from customers once we bill them? How much working capital do we have and how much uh, capital reserves we have? So those are the uh, the lenses that we use to assess our financial performance. So we'll start off giving you a quick overview on the uh, operating expenditures. What's presented here is our cumulative operating expenditures versus budget over the 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 biennium that you that we're in right now. The thick uh, blue line presents our actual expenditures and the dotted uh, uh, blue line is our budgeted expenditures that we forecast over that two year period. Uh, the good news is that the blue line is below the, the dotted line and because of the pandemic, we've taken a lot of measures to create additional financial flexibility uh, by uh, managing our, our uh, expenditures carefully. So we've, we've got some good news on that front. Uh, we also look at our capital expenditures and we are below budget. Now, in this case, uh, some of this is constrained by partner projects and other things, uh, the ability to get the work done. Uh, and so we'll let uh, Chief Engineer Pack and Water Supply Program Director um, Kraska discuss plans on, on the capital side as we go forward. But we're well under budget in this area as well. 
Uh, the not so good news is our water sales. So our customer demand remains soft. And in fact, uh, there is a, if you look at this chart, uh, the solid line is our daily average gallons per capita per day. It's a 12 month rolling average. Uh, the the uh, dotted line is sort of a history, a five year history of that. And you can see that uh, starting in the summer of 2019, our water sales started to decline and have stabilized at that, at that lower level. And if we look at uh, our water sales revenue, so we sell the, that water production per capita consumption, but if you look at the revenue itself, you can see that uh, we're well below budget. Now, this is not what we would like. We'd like to see the dark blue line in this case be above the dotted uh, budget line. And uh, that's been the case for, for quite some time, but right now we're seeing, um, we're seeing the reverse of that. And so how does it look on a, uh, on a monthly basis? And how does this how is this affected by by the pandemic? You can see here that uh, our soft water sales and water sales revenue uh, occurred actually started before the pandemic, and then we took a rather hard summer in 2020. Uh, we think some of that was related to the pandemic. When we get into the numbers, actually, uh, you can see that our commercial revenue is down uh, quite a bit more than our residential revenue, and we think that's related to to the pandemic. Uh, and then you can see in the in the fall, uh, kind of a, a, some good news there, those green bars that you see, uh, were, the relate, were related actually to some better summer sales. We have uh, bi-monthly billing cycles that are delayed. We had some forest fires with smoke that made it hard to read meters for a period of time September. We think that pushed some of our revenue into uh, the late fall, but uh, the economy is opening up. And then as the economy started to close down because of the pandemic, we saw again a reduction in our commercial sales. So on the water sales side, we have some challenges. Um, our SDCs, we're above plan for the SDCs or the biennium, but uh, that's uh, because of some early strong SDC sales. We look at this again on a monthly basis. You can see the effect of the pandemic had on system development charges. Now these are those one-time capital charges uh, that we used to offset uh, the cost of growth. Uh, and you can see once we hit the, the pandemic, uh, our SDC revenues declined uh, quite a bit. In February of 2021, this past month, we saw an uptick on that. That's actually somewhat expected because our SDC increases go into effect on March 1st. And oftentimes there's a bit of a run on SDCs in February as people try to beat that uh, increase that occurs in March. So what we're seeing here is a softness uh, in SDCs as well, especially if you look at the more recent history. Uh, the district's cash position remains remains strong, and in fact, much higher than what we had forecast, and that's largely because of the uh, slower capital expenditures that we've had, lower capital expenditures, as well as um, the mitigation that we've done on, on the operating expense side of trying to maintain that financial flexibility. So we are seeing a, a reduction in our cash balances, but we were planning on much greater a reduction in cash balance. One thing I want to point out is that uh, we have been doing all of our capital expenditures on the Willamette Water Supply Program as well as the in-district CIP has been done with uh, with cash funded from, from rates. We have currently about $50 million uh, sitting over at the EPA that we can access as part of our WIFI loan. We choose not to do that because we don't want to start paying interest on that money when our investments are earning actually not, not very much interest because of the current um, economic environment. So uh, when, when it looks at our cash flow and you take into account that $50 million that we can draw on, we're in, we're in pretty good shape right now. Uh, we look at our customers though to see uh, how the labor market is doing. That's a leading indicator that we look at for both collections as well as for water sales. And uh, we've seen a precipitous decline. What you see in this particular chart is the unemployment rate for Oregon, the Portland metropolitan area, and then Washington County. Washington County, of course, is where we do the bulk of our business. Washington County, if you're going to be, uh, if you're going to have a recession, it's a good place to be. It tends not to uh, suffer as much as the state as a whole, or even the entire Portland metropolitan area. Uh, but you can see, actually, uh, we had uh, a bit of an increase. Uh, we've kind of stabilized at that 6.2 percent. The, I'm sorry, the uh, the uh, 5.4, 5.6. Uh, percentage rate uh, as the economy went back into uh, sort of a, a lockdown mode around that Thanksgiving period. Uh, but what we've seen here, I think, is stabilization. 
we're, uh, we're hoping, and of course, hope is not a strategy, but we're hoping that as the vaccine is rolled out, that the economy will continue to recover. We're seeing that at the national level, and we're hoping to see that here in Washington County as well, uh, that our labor market will be a precursor to stronger uh, consumer and business activities and, and stronger water sales as we go forward. Uh, one of the other things that we're very concerned about are collections and uh, what we're looking at here are the number of customers that are in shutoff status now the board knows this well because we talk about this on a monthly basis but for the benefit of the budget committee i want to give you a little bit of a, a, a background on this the district uh, voluntarily implemented a moratorium on shutting off customers uh, when the pandemic uh, when the pandemic hit us back in march of 2020 and as a result, we have customers who would otherwise have been shut off that are not being shut off. And what this graph presents is the number of customers who would have met the criteria for being shut off, but uh, because the moratorium are not being shut off. We've got about 2,100 customers as of uh, February 28th that are in that status. Uh, we'll have uh, better information in the coming week on, uh, on March. We're still collecting that data. But still, we've got about uh, 2,100 customers that have not been paying their water bills. And uh, the account receivable for those customers that are in that shutoff status is about $914 for water. So this is just the water side. This doesn't include their sewer and stormwater management bill, just their water bill, $914,000. Uh, uh, yeah, $914,000 for, for that group of customers. Uh, the other thing that we look at is the age of the account receivable for these customers, and that's the average length of time that um, uh, that their bills are outstanding. Some are going to be longer than the average, some are going to be shorter than the average, but we can see that that has increased from 51 days uh, back in April to 90 days now. So we've had an increase uh, in the age of the account receivables, indicating that our customers are in fact finding it more difficult, or at least some of our customers, these customers in particular, are paying their water bills. We look at uh, our GIS system to see where those customers are, uh, to see if we can target uh, programs uh, to assist them getting current on their water bills. And this is an example of a chart that we get out of our GIS system that maps those account receivables uh, to the areas where, where our customers are having difficulty uh, paying their bills. So the, the bluer, the magenta, more blue magenta the areas, uh, the greater the uh, density of uh, payment problems that exist in that area. Uh, so it's not uh, district-wide, we do have areas of particular concern, and that indicates that we have customers in those areas that are finding it difficult to pay their, their bills. So where does that land? Uh, this is my fifth uh, biennial budget that I've actually been a party to, and this is the first time that I've actually had a, uh, a, a downer report, if you will, on our financial performance. But I just want to hit the key findings. First of all, our operating expenses are below budget, and, uh, and we've made adjustments as we've gone through the fiscal year to account for the challenges that our customers are having as well as the district's financial condition. Again, to provide us more financial flexibility. Capital expenditures are also below budget. Our water sales revenue are below projections, uh, but it seems that they have stabilized. So I don't see them dropping further. They've come down, they seem to have stabilized. And, and again, we're hopeful that they will um, return or at least improve. Assist development charges exceed plan, but they're slowed down, as you saw. And in fact, we're hoping again, as the economy picks up, that there will be a recovery uh, on our system development charges. Our projected ending fund balances are higher than we had forecast, uh, but that's largely because of the uh, capital expenditure savings that we've had. We remain debt free. As I mentioned, we've got $50 million sitting over the EPA that we can draw on. So we've got liquidity and we're in good shape uh, from that perspective. So on balance, I would say that we're starting the 2021, the 21-23 biennium with manageable challenges. And what I've said over the past uh, four uh, budget cycles is that we were in a strong financial position. Now I think we have manageable challenges um, as we go forward. Uh, actually, right here, I'll just take a quick pause, see if there are any questions going to turn the discussion in a different direction. Any questions about the district's financial performance? See, now I'm going to talk now about our financial strategy as we go forward. Uh, so as part of its uh, its responsibility to the board, we presented several financial strategies to the board and met with the board to, to develop a plan of moving forward 
We have an ambitious capital program to complete the Willamette Water Supply Program, as well as some needed investments in the district's uh, other capital program. Uh, so given that, we've worked closely with the board and developed strategies that the board can then uh, use as we go through that rate setting process that will happen this summer. Uh, we will be publishing a financial plan in May, but uh, the preliminary strategy that we have is presented here in terms of what would happen to a typical bill uh, that we're looking at about a $5 a month uh, to $6 a month increase, about 9.5%. Uh, you might ask, uh, wait a minute, I thought we were talking about 9.5%, which is 9.4%. It's the magic that uh, numbers round off when you, when you deal with pennies. Uh, this is the typical bill for a single family residential customer that has a 5 8 inch meter and 700 cubic feet of water per month. So that's our typical customer. And, uh, and these are the kinds of increases uh, that we're looking at. I wanna turn now. Paul, uh, yes. This is John. I, I missed the uh, the question, the uh, opportunity to ask a question back at the end of the last segment there. Uh, going back to customer demands, I know I noted that your pre-COVID, you started dropping off in May or March of 1919, and it dropped off up till the COVID and never recovered as far as demand. Now. Could that be also attributed to the higher cost of the water? Uh, it, it could be attributed to the higher cost of water. Uh, that's a good point. We have, um, we have in our forecast of revenue, we have been uh, taking into account uh, a reaction to the higher cost of water. And uh, for years, we've been exceeding our plan uh, as we uh, underestimated uh, our sales, basically, uh, assuming that our customers have a greater reaction to, to the um, a greater reaction to the price of water, as we went through the last financial plan, we had been wrong for so many years. We made an adjustment upwards on what we thought that water sales would be, uh, but the demand that we're seeing a reduction. It started in the summer of of 2019, largely, uh, and and if you look at it by customer classes. Actually, this past summer, the residential demands were, were, I wouldn't say strong, but returning, uh, and the commercial demands were quite low. Uh, and so I think partly that was a muted reaction to, to the um, pandemic. The other thing, and I mentioned briefly about the, the forest fires that we had, and this may seem like a crazy thing, but we had a period of time where it was unsafe for our meter readers actually to go out. I don't know if you remember that in September, we had the smoke and it was unsafe for people to be outside uh, working. And so we had to estimate meter reads and the protocol that the, the, the billing system uses to do that is it takes, uh, uh, it, it, it takes a percentage of the prior year amount. And of course, uh, we had a very low amount. So we ended up with customers had lower bills that were estimated. And then in the uh, later fall, much higher bills, and we saw that revenue kick up. So if you sort of make that additional adjustment, you look at the residential demands, it, it doesn't look like there's a huge price response. The other thing, uh, now I'm not sure if you're looking at the graph that showed the gallons per capita per day or the revenue, but the other thing we took into account in our revenue forecast was the annexation withdrawal from Beaverton. And so uh, that has affected our revenue, but that should not affect the gallons per capita per day because we to took it out of both the numerator and the denominator, right? Uh, so I think, uh, John, it's a bit of a mystery. We've got so many moving parts. We have these very long billing cycles of, of 60 plus days. Uh, and then we throw in a pandemic and a smoke event. Uh, it's, it's very hard for us to tease out how much that is a reaction to price uh, how much of his reaction to the economy and how much is reaction to COVID? I suspect it's a bit of all three, but uh, uh, our forecast going forward, we are expecting some recovery, but not the kind of recovery that we've had in prior years. So we're being much more um, uh, conservative in our estimate of water sales. I don't know if I answered your question or if I just introduced a bunch of additional questions, but. Yeah, the other issue is uh, density with the new developments going in is higher density development going into the areas. Yes. 
lower consumption per household. Yes, and in terms of, uh, and that's an excellent point. And when we forecast our revenue, we actually take that into account that uh, the the growth in the number of customers uh, is not equivalent to the growth in water sales. That water sales, in a sense, we got two things uh, working. And one is uh, conservation effect. And so some of the older housing stock is being turned over. The newer the newer homes are higher density, less outdoor water use, and newer plumbing fixtures. And we also have older homes that are being retrofitted with uh, newer plumbing fixtures and with landscaping that uses less water. And all those things can be a, a response to price as well as the turnover in housing stock. So we've tried to model the uh, uh, the uh, lower water sales for new customers. So if you look at our growth, we we actually estimate a growth in fixed charges a little bit higher than our growth in our vol volume water sales as a result of that. Thank you. Okay. And I could talk all day about these things, and I probably shouldn't, but uh, I appreciate the questions. Um, so I want to just take a moment and talk about where we are here in our budget process. So. Uh, and, and President Bagnell talked about uh, the fact that we're in a workshop. I mentioned that as well. So what we're doing right now is we're focusing on the requested budget. And this is management developing department level request uh, for uh, for appropriations. And so each of the departments is working with the finance department to develop these requests that we consolidate and present them to the budget committee. Uh, so that's what we're doing in the workshop. Uh, then we're going to transition over uh, and prepare what's the proposed budget. And that we will present to the budget committee at, in its formal budget committee meeting in May. And that'll be the, uh, the, the proposal that then we'll ask the budget committee to take action on. The budget committee then through its formal process will actually approve a budget forwarded to the board of commissioners who will then adopt that budget in their June meeting. And I mentioned that uh, this is a collaboration between the operating departments and the finance department. And uh, under Oregon uh, local budget law, there are seven appropriation categories that all the money rolls up into. Uh, and so we did different approaches to uh, forecast each of these, but these are the spending limits that are then set that uh, management lives within and, and only the board uh, can uh, make an adjustment to the spending between these appropriation categories. So the first is personnel services. So that's all the costs that we have to keep people here at the district working. Material and services are purchases of goods and services uh, that are not being capitalized or capital outlay or obviously things that are being capitalized. The rest of these things are really things that the finance people deal with and, and not so much the operating departments. Special payments uh, are those things that don't fit in one of the other appropriation categories. And for us, this is largely a pass-through payment uh, when we collect uh, right-of-way fees from our customers and pass it on to the cities that impose those rights-of-way fees on, on our customers. Debt service. Interfund transfer is the ability to move funds between funds. And of course, we need that to fund uh, the entire uh, capital program. And then general operating contingency. So those are the seven that we have. And within the district, uh, historically, these things have all been budgeted at the fund level. So we ask each of the departments to give us um, input on that. And we add it all up and we bring it to the board and, and we do it at the fund level. Now, with the prominence of our joint ventures, and this is the Willamette Intake Facilities Commission, the Willamette Water Supply Commission, this, uh, this has changed the, the uh, complexion of our budget process uh, somewhat. We've always had joint ventures. The Willamette River Water Coalition is an example of a joint venture that the district has managed. We've been the managing agency for, but those dollar amounts were rather trivial compared to what we're doing now. So within the uh, WWSP, which is that combination of the Willamette Intake Facilities and the Willamette Water Supply System, uh, the district through this budget process will be appropriating all those charges, all those that capital outlay uh, for that effort. And uh, Water Supply Program Director Kraska will be talking about that tonight. Uh, but I want to just give you a sense that there is a bit of a double count that has to occur here because we appropriate the money for those joint ventures. And then, for example, uh, Dave Kraska's department, which is like an internal consulting firm that sells all of its services to these joint ventures, uh, we charge the joint ventures for his time and we pay his staff and we buy the materials and services for his staff. 
And, uh, and then as the joint ventures, we issue invoices to the partners. We invoice ourselves. Uh, we invoice City of Beaverton, City of Hillsborough for the WIF. We also include then the other WIF partners. And so when we look at TVWD, we appropriate money to pay our bills to the joint uh, ventures. We appropriate money for the joint ventures to actually um, purchase the things that they need within the fund. And then of course we pay for Dave and his crowd in order to do this work. The bottom line is there's a lot going on with these joint ventures and next at uh, the next budget committee meeting, we'll be talking about how those dollars move uh, between the funds. But the important thing I wanna point out here too is the role that the departments play in preparing these things. So the departments tell the finance uh, department how many people they need and uh, the, care, the, uh, the grades of those people and how many overtime hours that they're likely to incur. And then we forecast what the personnel service cost will be based on our assumptions on healthcare costs and PERS and some other things. Uh, the material and services budget, the departments pull those together in the capital outlay as well. I mentioned the special payments. Those things are really things that uh, only a budgetary person could, could uh, enjoy working with. So we rely on the departments and what we're gonna hear tonight really is uh, the departments presenting their plans. But I wanna give you a bit of good news uh, and that's on the personnel services front that we've seen our, our personnel services cost uh, the trend in those costs uh, slow down. A couple of reasons why, and I want to present those to you tonight before we turn over to the departments to present their their plans. Uh, we've seen a, uh, a the increase in benefit costs have slowed down. Uh, we were seeing our especially our health insurance costs going up uh, year after year by uh, pretty good percentages. At the last renewal, which was January of, of this year, we actually saw a 2.3% reduction in our health insurance premium that we pay for our healthcare provider. Now, some of that is, believe it or not, related to the pandemic. I know I've got some deferred maintenance on my body, but I've been waiting uh, several months uh, that eventually uh, the doc at home is gonna send me into the doc at the, at the doctor's office to get uh, looked at. So. I think that as we exit the pandemic, we are going to see the utilization of our health insurance increase by employees. And because our health insurance is experience based, I think during this biennium, we may see our health insurance cost increase. But nevertheless, right now, we actually saw a decline of 2.3%. And it beats the heck out of the traditional estimate of 6 to 8% increase on an annual basis in health insurance costs. The other big item is the purse cost. And the purse cost have been offset really by a couple of things. You might remember two years ago when we put together a budget, we actually funded a side account uh, with PERS. Uh, we actually appropriated $20 million uh, based on uh, what's happened in the economy and some other things. We've only spent $10 million of that. The other 10 million remains at the district uh, in our cash balances and, and we're, we're not planning to spend that on a side account. Uh, but having said that, uh, we got the Employer Incentive Fund Match, which was a program that the state had uh, that allowed us to fund a side account and get an additional amount from that Employer Incentive Fund, which incentivized uh, PERS employers to reduce their unfunded actuarial liability in their pension plans. Bottom line is that side account has helped stabilize our PERS rates. The other thing are PERS reforms. So there's there have been some reforms in PERS that have caused a reduction in our PERS costs. Some of the uh, individual account program has been redirected so that employees pay a little bit more for their uh, retirement plan. And that has also stabilized our PERS rates. And the change in demographics as the district, as uh, some of our employees who are retiring tend to be in the system longer, they tend to be a higher tier in the PERS system, replaced by employees who are in the lower tiers with a less generous uh, retirement plan. So those phenomena have affected our, our PERS. The other thing is that uh, retirements, we, we don't like retirements because it affects our ability to get our work done and our retirees bring a lot of knowledge to the game. And when they leave, they take too much of it with them. Having said that, the newer employees come in generally at a lower cost. And they oftentimes come in at that lower benefit level for um, for the retirement system. So given all that, we've seen some good news on the personnel front. I, I do want to emphasize though that we're going to continue to verify our assumptions. The last thing I want to do is to underestimate our personnel cost and then come back to the board 
uh, for supplemental budget saying that we had uh, underestimated what those cost will be. But on the other hand, we want to be as realistic as possible. So when the departments present their personal service budgets, it's based on the assumptions of the people they're going to have, the overtime hours, and then uh, the finance department's one that turns that into, into dollars. And so I just want to say if, if we get it wrong, it was my fault, not their fault. Uh, they're doing uh, the, the best they can, as are we. Okay, with that, any questions uh, on the information I've presented here? I think I'm supposed to wait. Uh, Dave Kraska taught me, I think, eight seconds or something. So hearing none, uh, I'm going to pass this on to uh, our manager of customer service, uh, Andrew Carlstrom. Andrew? Great. Thank you, Paul. All right. Well, good evening, uh, President Bagnell, Board of Commissioners, and Budget Committee members. Um, I'm going to give you a walkthrough of uh, the customer services budget and some of the goals we have for the upcoming biennium. Next slide, please. All right, next slide. So as we talked about that the first budget workshop, there are four divisions within customer service, uh, general services, which is conservation and the CIS project, customer services and utility billing, field customer service and communications. Next slide. So looking at our operating budget for the upcoming biennium, um, I'll start at the chart on the right hand side first. You'll see that expenditures are, are staying even. Um, the red line, which is the FTEs, dipped just a little bit, and I'll talk about that um, in a couple minutes. But in terms of our goals for the upcoming biennium, I have them on the left hand side, and they're really in three categories modernization, feedback, and developing staff. So on the modernization side of it, this is really about transforming the district's meter to cash operations. And we're in the middle of the CIS implementation and also in the budget for this upcoming biennium is developing the AMI strategy. On the feedback side, the, there's an initiative for surveys, and this is for uh, soliciting customer as well as employee feedback to inform decision making at the district. And finally, uh, developing staff, and this is a continuation of what we've already been doing, but we will continue to develop skills for this transformation and also developing internal training capacity. All right, next slide. All right, so the next couple slides will give you some charts that you'll see in subsequent departments uh, presentations. And in looking at our personal services, uh, we're, we're holding even in terms of increase. Uh, a couple points. We had turnover in staff in um, three of the four divisions uh, in the current biennium. The one that we didn't was communication. Such changes as Paul indicated typically result in lower costs. But I wanted to just point out and then you'll see general services is higher. Um, one of the reasons for that is that we had a vacancy in the business analyst position and the increase reflects uh, benefit assumptions before we actually filled the position. For the limited duration positions uh, for the CIS project, we ended up filling uh, one of the positions, which was a project scheduler and with a contract resource rather than um, a district employee. So that's why you saw that red line on the on the previous slide go down a little bit. So we had four limited duration. Now it's three. Next slide, please. All right, and looking at materials and services, um, You'll see the increases in general services really reflect the AMI strategy development component, um, additional training, as well as the surveys initiative. But also that's a that's a net change. We also had reductions in conservation due to a lowered amount of um, rebates for high efficiency toilets. In customer service and utility billing, we had reductions that were related to uh, less bill printing, mailage, and postage. And the reason there is that customers continue to adopt electronic billing, electronic billing and payments. And I also wanted to note that leak adjustments continue to, to rise as they have in previous uh, biennial budgets. So for the upcoming biennium, it's going to be about 787,000 for the two year period. For field customer service, we had uh, a little increase uh, primarily due to meter maintenance 
And the driver there was during the uh, COVID operation, single worker tasks, uh, TVWD had employees that were, were doing uh, meter box assessments, and that resulted in identifying more damaged meters and boxes, which then we'll need to repair. And then finally, in communications, the reductions are due to fewer printed materials. Next slide, please. All right, capital outlay that we had in the previous biennium, the current biennium, uh, a little over 40,000, and that was for uh, replacement, planned replacement of the data caps, and these are the meter reading handheld electronic devices. That work is complete, and that's uh, we don't have any additional capital outlay for the upcoming biennium, and the CIS project is, is listed in the CIP. Next slide, please. All right, and looking at the, the summary by division, again, we're, we're holding steady as a department in terms of expenditures. Um, again, we had additions for AMI and surveys. We had uh, decreases for less dependent on dependence on printing and mailing, postage, and uh, lower conservation costs. Next slide. And then finally, when looking at uh, appropriation categories um, as a department, again, um, we're holding steady without increases. I'll just pause there, see if there are any questions. All right. Actually, Andrew, would you repeat the statistic you gave on how much of an increase you had for leak adjustments? That sounded like a really big number. Uh, it's going to be 787000 for the upcoming biennium, I believe. Paul, I believe that's an increase of about 100000 Um, I can, uh, President Bagnall will get that number. That's a great question. We're always want to have questions so that when I have that opportunity next uh, at the next workshop to answer questions, I'll bring that one forward. Yes, thank you. I'm just, you know, and having been a beneficiary of a leak adjustment, at one time in my distant past, I, I'm really glad the district does it, and I think it's a it's a nice program to encourage people to get those things repaired. I just really hadn't realized that the program was that big. Yes, it's it's been growing steadily for the last several biennia. Well, and uh, Andrew, can I just add? Uh, Please, this is Paul, I just add a little bit on that. When we estimate the leak adjustments, uh, oh, President Bagnon, you probably <laughs> can remember this, but it obviously responds to the bill itself. So as our water bills have increased, uh, there's a uh, almost proportionate share. So, you know, as water rates go up to fund the Willamette program, uh, then the the cost of a leak adjustment or the benefit to the customer is is even more so, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely it does. I just, I, I guess part of where I'm coming from on this is I wonder if our system is getting leakier. <laughs> and that would probably, that would make a lot of sense if it is, since the system's getting older. Oh, good question. We'll, we'll get some answers for you on that question. And I think, uh, hold that thought too, when we get to the AMI discussion as well. Uh, yes. as to earlier detection of leaks. Yes. All right, um, why don't we go to the next slide, Paul? All right, so the next thing is, to, I'm gonna give you an update on the, the Customer Information System or CIS project. Next slide. So I, I know the board has seen this um, information like this before, but I wanted to remind the, the budget committee what the, the meter to cash cycle is um, for a water utility. And on the right hand side, you'll see a number of functions, managing customer data, me reading meters, uh, rates, bills, payments, credit collections, and analysis of the GL and revenue. Uh, these are components of what's called the meter to cash cycle, and that's the system that we have that's uh, essential for managing our meter to cash cycle is what we're modernizing with the, the new CIS. Next slide, please. So where we are at this point, um, again, this is a this project is a partnership between TBWD and Clean Water Services, um, whom we're calling the partners. 
Uh, we're sharing costs, decision making, and ownership of the CIS in this project. This is a foundational system for modernizing meter to cash. It's also essential for future improvements, including AMI. So we conducted during the current biennium a, a rigorous selection and contracting process for a new system. And the contracting process was uh, was took longer than we thought. And it's important to get it right because this is going to be a, a long term relationship. And with, with successive uh, renewals, this could be easily a, a 15 year relationship. So the new CIS provider is Open International. Their product is called SmartPlex. We're going to be going live with the, the CIS batch processing as well as a new portal for customers. So we're now in the implementation of the solution. We're on a very fast and aggressive schedule. Our go live is, is currently projected for the first calendar quarter of 2022. And as we always tell the board, we're dedicated to configuring, not customizing. We want to change our processes, not the system. Next slide, please. So the cost estimate, this is what we budgeted in the, in the current biennium is 9.5 million. That includes selection as well as implementation. Um, in the selection, a variety of services to help us get to uh, not only a vendor finalist, but also a contract. And then in phase two, this includes the vendor costs as well as a variety of third party services, um, as well as project labor and contingency. So we, we've had to add additional resources on the third party side to help us meet the schedule. Um, we're also one unknown at this point is how much on-site time we'll have. And there's a cost component there, which uh, results in how much travel our, our vendor staff and third party staff going to have. So right now it's been an all virtual project, but um, that's, that's an unknown at this point due to COVID. Next slide, please. So I've got a, another slide here just to kind of show you the project life cycle. Life cycle. Paul, you want to hit the next? So the, the first stage really was uh, initiating the project. We did an, a needs assessment. We formed a partnership with Clean Water Services and we budgeted the resources. Next. The selection phase, this was selection and negotiation, and then transition to the implementation um, during the negotiation. Next. The, and then we're now in the implementation phase, and that started mid-November last year in 2020. Um, the stages we're in right now would be really planning, design, and, and a little bit in construction, but later this year we'll get into testing and training and preparing for the go live. After the go live, we have the stabilization, which is literally we're adapting operations to operating under the new system. Next. And finally, we'll transition to ongoing operations and continuous improvement. So during the project, we'll be developing our, our continuous improvement roadmap of what are we not doing with the go live solution and what's on our roadmap for a subsequent of uh, smaller implementations. And in the middle of the diagram, you'll see Project Cumulus, and that's the name of the project. The solution that we're uh, implementing is a software as a service, and the, the data will be in the cloud, which is one of the reasons we chose the cloud for the symbol of the project. All right, next slide, please. I've showed this before. Um, I'm not going to read all of these, but I wanted to focus on the, the first one, which is addressing current and projected business needs. And that includes uh, AMI, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more here. All right, next slide, please. And then the triple constraint, this is another look at scope schedule budget. Um, I've already went, gone through what, our, what we're going live with. Again, this is foundational, foundational for modernizing our meter to cash operations. Fast schedule uh, followed by stabilization. Uh, we're still at 9.5, which is our budgeted amount. Uh, cost sharing is accomplished through IGA. And the picture at the bottom is an example of a, a meeting, a project meeting, and everything on this project and the implementation has been has been in a virtual environment. We're really hopeful that with the vaccine and with uh, changes in in COVID cases over time that we can have on-site time with the vendor, but um, if that doesn't happen, we're, we're prepared to meet the challenge. 
All right. Andrew, next. Uh, yes. You have a question from President Bagnell. Oh, yes, please. So this is just one of those Snoopy Bagnell questions. Since everything has been virtual for the past year, do we still have the, the cube, the, the portable that was the Center for Utility Billing Excellence? Is that still on site? It, it's still on site. And the reason why is we, we, we haven't been able to get a, a, a firm fix on when COVID will allow us to reopen and be on site in the project. So at, right now we do have it. It was used for a time for the EOC, but um, it's still it's still on site right now. Yes. Thanks. Like I say, I was just curious. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Plus, I really like the name. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next slide, Paul. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, advanced metering infrastructure or AMI. Next slide. So this is information from a Water Research Foundation report about what AMI actually is. Um, this is a system that this says collects time differentiated, differentiated consumption information. Um, think smart meters, um, although the report here said one or two readings a month for us, it would be readings every either every month or every other month, every other month for residential customers. So you can configure an AMI to take meter data uh, multiple times per day. And let's talk a little bit about some of the benefits uh, on, the, on the customer side. Right off the bat, the customers have a better sense of what their consumption is. We can automate the meter reading process. We're not using vehicles. We're reducing the estimated reads which also includes we're not doing truck rolls to invest, investigate reads. Really important, Tom talks about this quite a bit from his experience at the city of Bend, is uh, improved leak detection. And we talked about the leak adjustment budget. Um, with AMI, you can get customer notifications. So if they have abnormal consumption, they can get a notification as opposed to not having awareness in some circumstances uh, until they get their next bill. Tom, do, is there anything you wanted to add to that, just in terms of uh, leak detection? Sure, uh, Andrew. Um, what I'll say is, I, I reached out to the city of Bend. They they implemented fully implemented their AMI program in 2012, and I was talking with some of the staff there. Since 2012, they've notified more than 14,000 customers of leaks, uh, and so these are leaks that. Um, they're detecting that day and are able to notify that customer that day that, you know, there's something going on on their system that's causing water loss. Um, so uh, kind of getting to the point that Commissioner Bagnell, President Bagnell was uh, uh, bringing up earlier, uh, this is a, it's a very different situation when you're calling a customer uh, ahead of time and letting them know that you do have a leak and you have a responsibility to take care of it. You can document all that. And if a customer chooses not to take care of it, you're not, you're not, you're not waiving that bill. Um, you're asking people to take care of the leak um, before it becomes a massive bill and more importantly, before it does property damage. So um, that's that's one of the the many benefits uh, of AMI, um, and uh, there, there's you know the city of Bend has certainly experienced many others in their ability to educate customers uh, on an apples to apples basis. Uh, so in other words, um, instead of just caring, uh, uh, comparing a water user across the board to all other water users they can actually compare water users to people with similar size homes and similar size lots. So you can see how much water use you're using in comparison to somebody that's a lot like you. Um, and, and that's a very different, uh, you know, piece of information for people than to just get a generic, this is how much water you used and this is how you compare against all other customers. So th there's many, many things you can do um, and, and including uh, you can set it so that it can alarm 
if there is a backflow event. Uh, and that is a, that is a really big issue. And it's, it's frankly a, a big security issue um, that uh, can be addressed when you can, when you can be notified immediately of a, of a backflow event. So I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Andrew. I could talk about it for a while, but it's, I'll let you go with it. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. So Tom talked about things that really relate to water loss distribution information and certainly reduce theft. All right, uh, next slide, please. So AMI is integral to our modernization of TBWD's uh, meter to cash cycle. The purpose of starting the AMI initiative here is, and ultimately having an AMI system would be to provide uh, innovative technologies, AMI technologies that would support both operations um, and TVWD customers. One thing I wanted to note that the new CIS, the Open Smart Flex, um, for an AMI system, you need a meter data management program. Uh, MDM, which is the acronym, is already built into the CIS that we selected. Uh, it would be a matter of amending the contract and activating that module but it's the CIS we have is a, it's a holistic solution that has MDM already baked into it. Um, AMI, I wanted to note, it's one path for TVWD to achieve monthly billing, um, which was a recommendation of the rate advisory committee. So in terms of how we get to monthly billing, obviously AMI is one path. Another path is increasing staff and vehicles to get more frequent reads. Um, and another path that we did investigate as part of the CIS project is uh, something along the lines of, of bill splitting. And we were wondering, do we have this, do we have a monthly billing as part of the CIS go live? Ultimately, we decided no. And the reason why is that um, the bill splitting methodology is really not um, favored by very many utilities right now. Customer communication can be challenging and, and typically relies on a degree of estimation. And we know from our experiences when we do have estimation, like with the with the fires last fall, um, it's it's challenging on the communication side. All right, next slide. So for the the upcoming biennium, we're requesting funds for starting an AMI project. And this is really for developing the strategy, AMI strategy, 200,000. Um, total project implementation cost estimate we would present to the board after we developed the strategy. But this is a, this is a large project. Um, TBWD, we also want to pursue partnerships and Tom's um, aggressively looking to into external funding opportunities for AMI from recent um, congressional bills. And again, like just like the CIS project, AMI initiative would be a multidisciplinary effort within TVWD. All right, um, next slide. So the last thing I have tonight is surveys, the surveys initiative. Next slide. And um, this is an initiative that will be led by uh, Communications and Public Affairs by uh, Andrea Watson. And essentially what we're looking for is to uh, get useful feedback um, to to measure and understand both the, the customer experience, CX, and also the employee experience, which is EX, and use that trend data for deci district decision making. So the initiative that we have in the budget is includes funds to be used for uh, both co consultant and for software um, in both designing, delivering, and interpreting those surveys, both on the external side and the internal side. Um, we want, to, we want to use both external expertise and we also want to develop internal staff capacity for doing this. So again, communications will lead this initiative and work um, with other district departments. And with that, uh, next slide. Are there any questions I can answer for the board and budget committee? I think that was eight seconds. Um, moving on to engineering operations, and I'll hand this over to Carrie Peck, the chief engineer. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so uh, we've got myself and um, Dave Kraska's program 
left, and I think we're probably at a halfway point um, on tonight's um, work session workshop. Would you like to take a short break, Commissioner Bagnell, or would you like for me to continue on with our presentation? You all been sitting for over an hour now, so just thought I'd ask. So, so I'm a firm believer in the whole 2020 20 thing, where every 20 minutes you. <laughs> Take a break from your computer for 20 seconds and stare at something that's 20 feet away. <laughs> All right. So, so I, I I would love a short break. We can keep it maybe just to to five minutes if that's possible. I think that would be great. Um, so my computer clock says it's 7:15. So if we can come back at 7:20 and we'll start back up at 7:20. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, it's 720 and we are back. <laughs> and I'm sure everyone is, is as just as refreshed as I am from that five minute break and totally ready to hear all about engineering and operations. So take it away, Chief Engineer Peck. Okay. Um, are you seeing the screen? Okay, yep. so I took the control. I, I took control over the presentation, so I hope I don't mess this up. So, um, before we get going, I just wanted to give a quick update on the the cube question, Commissioner Bagnell. Um, we did re redo or renew our lease with the with the company that we're borrowing that um, um, structure from, and was able to or Colin. Um, Colin Fleming from our facilities group was able to negotiate a lower rate, um, probably because they didn't want to move it during COVID or or whatever. But anyway, we're renting the facility at a lower rate than what we had been using. So that's a slight good news that I wanted to share with you before we got going. That is good news. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so not all of my presentations are good news. So we'll just start from there. So, um, OK, good evening. Um, President Bagnell, commissioners, and the budget committee. I want to first thank you for your commitment and services to the district. I know um, doing these uh, long meetings are not easy, um, especially when it's beautiful outside and you want to be sitting out and going for a walk. But we appreciate the the um, attention and the, the dedication that you have provided to the district. What I'm going to do tonight, as um, Paul explained earlier, is to review our operating budget for the engineering and operations department. And I'll also review the um, capital improvement program that we are responsible for implementing. So in the next biennium, the engineering and operations um, department is proposing an operating budget of $27,038,499. Um, we are um, requesting 44 equivalent um, employees, staff members, to continue to deliver high quality water by continuing to work with the in-house water quality task force that we have formed and to invest in needed infrastructure for water quality. We're working to develop a robust asset management program that's going to maximize asset value and increase seismic resiliency by finding the right balance between preventative and corrective maintenance tasks. We will be working for successful commissioning of the Willamette Water Supply Program through additional staff training and getting our distribution system ready to implement recommendations from the water supply integration project that we're presently working on. And in support of district's human investment priority, We'll be implementing project management training program and also working to create and document standard operating procedures for knowledge transfer before the retirements accelerates even more. We're requesting two new staff this biennium, um, a new staff for the supervisory control and data acquisition system, also known as SCADA, and a waterworks operator. Um, We've been working on staffing requirements for post-2026 operations. And in the next biennium budget, we will most likely be presenting additional staffing requirements so that we can successfully meet the needs of um, Willamette supply system. With that as a background, um, the department's requested personnel serv services show slightly a relatively minor change. And as Paul already explained um, earlier, the reasons for reduction in personnel services, I'm not going to go over these line, line item by line item. Um, we're even with the two additional staff that we're requesting, we're basically, there's not a whole lot of significant changes that are being proposed for um, personnel services budget in this biennium. Unlike the personnel services, however, our requested material and services, materials and services budget show some increases. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide, so bear with me. Um, as you can see, um, we're requesting a significant increase in general services line item. 
There are four um, initiatives that are kind of rolled up into this line item. They include professional services to complete the asset management program development, condition assessments for reservoirs and pump stations to support the asset management program, GIS master plan update, which was last completed in 2008. And you can only imagine how much to, um, technology changes have occurred in the past 13 years in the GIS technology. So this master plan is in a desperate need of an, of an update. We're also budgeting funds for work needed to meet the latest regulatory requirements for lead and copper rules. These four initiatives add up to over $1.2 million. So of the 1.9 million or close to $2 million um, general services, um, professional services line item, we're you know, estimating um, more than half of that is for the four items that I just mentioned. The increase is moving down to the water resources um, division. The increase associated with the water resources division budget is mostly due to professional services needed for implementing a comprehensive water quality data management solution. We really need this program not only for our district's current program needs, but also for the future um, needs of Willamette Water Supply System, as well as the Willamette Intake Facility Commission. As the managing agency, it is vitally important to begin now so that we are fully prepared um, for not only collecting, but also having the ability to analyze the data that's necessary to run these facilities. The increases associated with the construction and maintenance budget is to accommodate additional external contract services not related to um, capital improvement program projects. We are also planning to demo, demo the um, demolish the old reservoirs located in Cornell and Bonnie Slope sites so that we can um, market these sites as a um, buildable sites and surplus the properties and realize a little bit of income from that. And um, eliminate the risks associated with um, having a vacant facility or sites um, on our books. So, so I want to take a quick pause to see if you have any questions about our materials and services request. It's a pretty big ask, so want to make sure that I've provided all the information that you would you need. I think that was about eight seconds. So, okay. We're well, moving on to um, capital outlay. You see 969% increase. Um, this is a big number, um, but more so than the number, the, the dollars is actually pretty big too. But 300,000 of the $434,000 budget request is solely dedicated to the project management software associated with the project management training initiative that I had talked about earlier. So um, that's associated with that capital outlay. This slide shows um, summary of all of our requested budget by each division. So I didn't want to go through division by division um, request and the changes um, because we've got quite a few divisions. And wanted to just provide you with the summary information. The um, budget sheets that you received have all of these information in it, and I um, am open to answering any questions um, that you might have on this and the following, which is also a summary of uh, appropriation by categories, um, both in personnel services as well as materials and services um, and capital outlay. So again, I just want to take a pause and ask for any questions of our um, requested operational budget requirement or requests. I would like to say that uh, how much I appreciated getting that packet yesterday morning, because, you know, as a former budget officer myself, I, you can imagine I looked at the detail and I appreciated having it to look at. And that that's kept me from asking a lot of dumb questions tonight. So there you go. <laughs> well, there's no dumb question, especially from you, Commissioner Bagnall. <laughs> but um, but I, I think that, you know, the, 
the recognition to getting those packages out um, goes all to Paul and Joe. I, Joe, I think, I don't know if he slept for the past week or so getting all of our information together. So really big kudos to the finance department for pulling all the information together. So um, Commissioner Sanders, you have yeah, your hand. I actually wanted to uh, um, agree with Bernice, Commissioner Bagnell, uh, that it was really helpful to have this paperwork yesterday so that um, indeed we kind of had a heads up with what was going on today, what the discussion was, and um, yeah, I didn't embarrass myself with any stupid questions either. Not that I would embarrass myself, but exactly. it was really <laughs> helpful to have those, to have the paperwork yesterday. Thank you. All right. So might I just add, uh, this is one of those things, I appreciate these comments because we did this because of the pandemic, but given the, the comments we just heard, this is now going to be part of our standard process. Yeah, we might do it again. Yeah, even if yeah, we don't have I, I think that's a great idea because, you know, as many budget meetings as I've been in, I it, it and, you know, gosh, people with a lot of budget experience are on our budget committee. And I always worried when we would be in the meetings and I would see them flipping back and forth, flipping back and forth to try and find what they're looking for. So it's it. It's it's a nice addition to have it in advance, and I'm sorry that that Joe never gets to sleep. But <laughs> actually, I don't know. His effort. <laughs> I just know he worked really hard. <laughs> so, okay. Any other questions, or should I move on? Okay, I'm going to take the silence as a direction to move forward. So, okay. The next few sec next segment is um, I'm going to just pivot over to the district's capital improvement program. Um, sometimes this is known as the CIP, and all, all of us in the business know how much we love acronyms. I will hopefully not slip into the acronyms very often, but please forgive me if I do. Um, just want to remind everyone that the objectives for the capital improvement program are to address capacity improvement projects replacement projects that are needed on base, based on asset conditions, age, or to enhance um, resiliency. Many of our projects actually are relocations that are required by other agencies like the county when they go and widen um, roadways and our assets are underneath their roadway. Um, some of those projects don't come with a lot of um, options or uh, warning. And, um, you know, when when county comes and asks us to move our facilities, we we jump and do it quickly. So um, those projects do take a lot of our effort in uh, making sure that they they are successful. So Paul already talked about some of this, but last year we delivered nearly eight billion gallons of high quality drinking water to our customers using um, 700 over 700 and 52 miles of pipe among 41 pressure zones serving elevations from 150 foot to 990 foot. Because of our system has so many pressure zones, we pump water with 12 pump stations and ensure proper pressure with over 55 pressure regulating facilities. We have 23 active storage reservoirs with the total volume of 67 uh, million gallons One aquifer storage and recovery facility located in Cooper Mountain area with the capacity of 300 million gallons. We often use our wa use water from our um, this aquifer storage recovery center or facility during the high high demand months during the summertime. And to top that, we also operate one electric generation station. Our main goal of providing safe drinking water is provided, supported with water quality samples from over 150 water quality sampling stations located throughout the district um, area. And last year, <clears throat> because of the single worker um, opportunity that was given to us by COVID, we managed to collect over 6,000 water quality samples that were used to um, model some of the water quality system in our 
water quality in our system and also to provide some additional um, improvements to the area and how the distribution occurs. So as you know, um, district publishes a six year capital improvement program, but in reality, we have projects planned for much longer horizon. The sources of these projects are a water master plan um, that was most recently completed in 2018. The supervisory control and data acquisition master plan, which was completed just last year. Asset management plan that will be completed in the coming biennium. Um, needs identified by our operators and maintenance staff and also either other agencies and um, developers that require us to do certain things. Yes, Commissioner Dunn. Uh, I noticed that you said there was one generating station. Which one have we abandoned? Oh, did I just mess up? I was referring to the Center Street generation station. Okay, so the other one at uh, uh, 185th and 26th, does that still work? Oh, are you referring to the Pico generator? I guess that's what I'm referring to. Uh, uh, Pete, Pete Boone is online. Pete, is that the other one that we're, Commissioner Doan is referring to, or do we have another one that I don't know about? Yeah, there's there's the one at 158th Avenue and, and Highway 26. And yes, that's still in service. And we probably didn't include it on here because we used uh, all of the electricity generated from that one locally at that, at that vault. Right. So the, the generation station that I was referring to, we actually generate electricity and put it back on in the grid and we make money off of that one. The Pico okay. generator is solely for um, providing electricity for our SCADA um, system located at 158th and um, Highway 26. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, so after projects get identified as a need, um, once, once they're identified, we use um, eight different criteria to rank each of the projects. And we also consider the initiative priorities um, of the ones that um, Tom talked about earlier in the presentation this month, tonight. Um, we work with a finance group and CEO to develop recommended capital improvement program once all these projects are all put together. It's like making sausage except cleaner because Nick Augustus, who's in charge of um, creating the capital improvement program, is incredibly uh, detailed and organized, and um, so it's not as bad as looking at making sausage. I believe you, well, you all have the copies of the um, proposed capital improvement program plan in hard copy. So, but I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes um, to explain what's included in that plan. Specifically, I wanted to, what information you could find in each of the fact sheets that, that are included in the um, handout or the packet that you received yesterday. So as you can see, it has a site map that kind of identifies where the location, the location of the um, project. We have key drivers. These are the criteria that I just mentioned that um, rise to the top for how the project were selected. Um, a very simple, brief project description and then the meat of um, stuff that that um, Paul loves to look at are um, how the things are funded and um, you know where what the who the project manager is just just the facts about how, what the project is going to um, do and you know how much it's going to cost when is it going to get done and so on down the line. One of the things that Paul and I talked about even as we were developing this presentation um, is to increase the um, expand the project fund project uh, funding sources um, box to perhaps include um, potential grant funding or WIFIA loan funding. So, you know, um, Tom has been working diligently trying to find some additional sources of funds for some of our projects. And if we're successful, we want to be able to communicate with you and the community on where these um, dollars are coming from. So we'll probably be expanding that box in the next biennium's um, fact sheets. So just that's just a quick heads up. And that's good to know. You know, back when those fact sheets were first developed, 
getting grant funding for a relatively well-heeled water utility was not a thing. <laughs> so that's why it wasn't included. Right. We we love um, we love free money. Everybody does. So we're going to try to get our share to the best ability we can. We have. So this this slide and the next slide kind of co cover the eight categories of criteria that we look or we use to um, rank and prioritize the the uh, capital improvement program projects, and they're included in the key drivers um, in the fact sheets that I just went over. So again, um, criteria that were used to develop the rank the projects. Once the projects are scored and ranked, um, they're identified as to where they're going to go. In addition to that, um, for major critical infrastructures like reservoirs and pump stations, mm -hmm. we've done a little bit of categorization of these these projects and. The commissioners, um, I think the the board commissioners have seen this, but the the um, um, budget committee hasn't yet. So let me just describe um, these very simple categories: green, yellow, and red. They're not very um, um, exciting, but it looks like my oh, it's just my slide. Okay, um, they're simple, and I think they, you know, basically. Um, um, drive the point. Green categories are, in, are infrastructures that are in great structural and mechanical conditions. So Grabhorn, the Grabhorn Reservoir that you see in a picture there was completed um, just recently and is an example of structure that would be categorized as green. Yellow categories include infrastructures that require some repairs but are also seismically and operationally vulnerable. An example is, an Ingle, is the Inglewood Reservoir. We try very hard to maximize value of um, our facilities in this category because the necessary repairs for these, category, these facilities in the um, yellow category still offer positive values. So the dollars that we're putting in are still giving us um, more benefit than the, the marginal dollar that we would be using. The red category, however, is just what you might think it is. Um, facilities in this category need major help, most likely complete replacement, um, and the need is right now. Um, in most cases, fix of, fixes to these facilities really don't offer more, more value, um, so there is no real sense of trying to make it last any longer. So fortunately, um, most of our critical big structures still fall under green cat green category, and some of you have seen these these slides um, before. Facilities like Grabhorn and Richwood View are categorized as green, and again, green category is defined as being great structure structural and mechanical conditions with only superficial repairs or routine preventative maintenance needed to keep uh, up needed for upkeep. And as you can see, a lot of our facilities are in this category. Yellow category includes um, facilities like Inglewood, Sunset, Thompson, among other facilities. You might note asterisk next to North Road and 189th Reservoirs. These two facilities probably should go into the red category, but we've left them in the yellow category because we have very effective recovery plan um, in place for actual emergencies should they happen. And, and we think that um, we think we can manage these facilities just fine um, as a yellow category. The red category includes um, includes um, facilities like Taylor's Ferry, Goyak, and Somerset Reservoirs. In addition, Viewmont and Catlin Crest and Inglewood pump stations are also all in need of replacement. This slide looks, will look really different in the coming biennium the next time I do this presentation because each of these facilities are planned for either replacement or restoration in the coming biennium. Goyak Reservoir will probably remain stay in this category because we have to complete some other projects this biennium in order for us to um, work on that, that reservoir. 
But again, we have an effective recovery plan should that um, Goyak Reservoir need to come offline. In addition, the Viewmont and Catlin Crest pump stations are being replaced this year. We're in process of completing needs assessment for the Inglewood pump station. And once that's completed, we will make a decision on whether to demo or, or to repair the pump station. Again, fortunately, this listen is list this listen list isn't very long. Unfortunately, um, we highly recommend moving quickly on appropriate fixes for these facilities. We don't really have any more time to wait, in my opinion. And if COVID wasn't a thing right now, we would be um, having a physical tour of these and other facilities. So instead, um, I'll be reviewing limited aspects of major projects, the major red categories um, in the next few slides. But I wanted to um, direct your attention to the website that you see here, www.tvwd.org 2021 CIP virtual tour. So working with communications um, team, our tech GIS technician, Nick LaRue, has completed a story map and is posted on this website. And so if you um, go to this website or if you have an electronic version of this presentation, click on that link, um, you'll be directed to a um, art map um, similar to stuff that you would see in a, in a GPS kind of a mapping. Once you're there, use your roller on your mouse to go up and down to explore maps, pictures, and some descriptions that are associated with the particular picture that you're looking at. It's just a, a interactive way of looking at uh, what we would have been doing if we were able to um, take you on a tour. So, so because I can't take you on a tour, I w and I didn't want to chance the um, technical difficulties that one might experience through these um, teams meeting, I went ahead and just put together boring um, PowerPoint slides of the facilities that we'll be moving forward with in terms of um, fixing next to biennium. So the first is Taylor's Ferry site that is aging and is in need of replacement, including the reservoirs, the pipeline, the pi uh, piping on site is very, very poor condition. The district plans to replace all piping on site. Um, this is the only storage in the 985 pressure zone. Um, Pre-designed for the fixes are complete and the land use has been approved. The design for twin tanks will save um, construction costs by allowing the contractor to utilize the same forms. And by moving both tanks to the upper site, it also addresses the current issue we have um, with some dead storage in in the existing steel tank on the lower side, the one that you see on the um, northern, at the far side of the picture, this one here. Um, and when the when it's all done, a new pump station will allow TVWD to completely be off of Portland system in 2026. Design for the project will start in 2021 this year. Mm. The project, um, the Farmington Fluoride and Flow Control Facility project started as a different project. You may remember, if you have an old um, copy of this uh, capital improvement program descriptions, you might note that this used to be called Farmington Pump Bi Booster Pump Station um, Project or 209th and Farmington Pump Station, sometimes it's as referred to as. We started this project to receive water from Willamette supply Willamette water supply system when it was and it was originally intended to provide a second fee to the Cooper Mountain system earlier this year however we learned that the project was going to be cost prohibitive for now we were experiencing um, um, financial issues and the project came in almost double the original cost of estimating so our staff um, got together I just our staff got together and we quickly look for some alternatives and um, develop a strategy that would meet the original intent of providing secondary fee to Cooper Mountain area and also to receive flows from Willamette supply system. 
um, within the uh, originally appropriated budget. With change scope, the facility will be constructed prior to 2026 with an initial capacity of 6.5 million gallons per day. Um, we will expand the facility to an ultimate capacity of 17 million gallons a day when it's needed, probably in about 10 years or so. Somerset Reservoir is the only storage in the district's 1045 pressure zone, and it's in need of maintenance, um, specifically coating and safety improvements. The facility is not seismically resilient, and this pressure zone is deficient in storage volume. A replacement future tank is recommended in the master plan in the long-term horizon in 2049 to 2069 horizon. Um, as a backup, two full pump, uh, pump station backs up the, this pressure zone and the 820 pressure zone has excess storage that will help provide um, water in this zone. The work that we're doing, we're going to be embarking this biennium is actually going to be um, in cooperation with the Portland Water Bureau. We have a um, connection to their system in this uh, similar pressure zone. And we're working on an um, agreement that will allow us to take system, take this reservoir offline and do the repairs as necessary and still be able to um, provide water to this pressure zone customers. So without, I don't think you should see any difference while we're working on this in the summer and the next biennium. So to end the, um, the capital improvement program highlights. I wanted to just highlight or end it with a completed project. This is the a couple of pictures from Metzger North South Fireline improvement um, that was completed this year. And even during the COVID time frame, we were able to successfully complete this very complex and challenging project. We installed over 10,000 feet of 12 and 16 inch diameter pipes. We used um, trenchless method to go across Highway 99 and didn't have to close the highway down at all. Um, we also experienced some steep terrain and liquefiable soils in the area that um, allowed us to um, look for designs that were um, seismically um, resilient for our pipe in this area. So, and was and as with um, most of our projects, Justin Dyke from I'm going to give a shout out to Justin Dyke from our communications group, who um, always does just an excellent job of communicating with the stakeholders and and property owners. And there were quite a few businesses that we were impacting with the construction, and he just did a, a fantastic job keeping them all updated and in process, in pro, you know, in up to date with things that were happening. So. So back to the budgets, um, the capital improvement program includes projects in various groups and the capital improvement program um, sheets that or the, the handout that you received, you will find these categories divvied up into sources, um, both with the, with the um, joint ventures as well as our own source. Um, they're in, in, all of the storage projects are um, clumped together as well as pump station, pipeline um, and vaults, facilities, fleet re um, replacement and IT uh, information technology and meters and services. So when you're looking at the um, um, that document, you'll find projects in those categories as I just mentioned. Um, one thing that you might note is um, our proposed biennium capital improvement program is just a little more than $133 million. And of this, 80, about $83 million are for Metzger Pipeline East project. This project is actually being completed by our partners at um, Willamette Water Supply Program team. And the balance, if you take the balance between 133 minus 83 is about $50 million. And that is going to provide much needed improvements to the district's critical assets. And I think we're getting a huge value with um, our estimated um, improvements in the coming couple of years. 
So these next couple of slides give you um, directions to specific pages that were that are included in your packet um, for the capital improvement program, and it sends you to um, fact sheets, project fact sheets for each of these specific projects. So, so for example, if you wanted to learn more about the Taylor's Ferry Reservoir Replacement Project, you can turn to page 15-15, and it, you'll find the uh, project fact sheet that is related to the uh, Taylor's Ferry Reservoir Replacement Project. Same thing here. Um, these are um, small diameter pipes. We have quite a few that have been identified um, and so on down the line. These projects pages will direct you to um, those projects that have been identified to date. And again, the Metzger Pipeline East project can be found, descriptions for that project can be found at um, these pages that are identified here, 15 through 15 61 to 15 63. And I just can't express um, enough of the, the criticality associated with completing the Metzger Pipeline East project um, successfully. And we have all the um, confidence in our team over at the PMO to be able to complete that project. Fact sheets for other capital improvement program items can also be found in these pages for vaults and PRV valves, facilities, fleet, customer information system, um, services, and meters and um, ser other services that are, that are needed. So for six year, I, I think I mentioned that um, we have six year CI, uh, capital improvement program. As a summary to the six year program, we're anticipating $240 million, about just shy, something shy of $250 million. But I wanna give you a heads up that um, this estimate probably will be very different this time, the next time we meet. Um, and it's because we are developing the asset management program, as I have mentioned, and I have no doubt that we'll be, we'll start needing to really focus on projects to enhance seismic readiness with our critical infrastructure, as well as getting back to many of the deferred infrastructures um, upgrades that are going to be needed in the coming years. So I think I just want to give you a heads up that this number is going to change and I don't want you guys to panic because I think we can we're going to work closely with the finance group to make sure that we're doing what we need to get done um, in a um, fiscally um, responsible manner. I think that's my, oh, one more slide. Um, these are similar, similarly, you can find additional fact sheets. The fact sheets associated with six year CIP projects are a little bit less um, defined as the ones that we're be, we'll be working on in the next two by, next two years, but um, they're still there and, and these are all identified in these pages, as you noted, as noted here. And I think that is my last slide. So. Can I answer any, um, I can answer any easy questions for you. Um, I mentioned that Nick Augustus, Pete Boone, Joel Carey, and Matt Oglesby, those are my division managers. Um, they're all here at the, at the virtual meeting tonight, and they can answer any of your hard questions if you have them. Well, we are here is, at your service. This is Jim Doan, and I just want to, uh, Congratulate your staff. Carrie uh, went very quickly over the uh, the pump station on Farmington Avenue, and I just want to point out what an incredible piece of, for lack of a better word, of uh, engineering went in there. Uh, we needed to save some money, and so uh, she and the staff looked at what was really needed and when it was needed and uh, decided that there was a better way. And so uh, the savings totaled about $10 million and uh, gave us uh, a second supply uh, tying in with Beaverton. And uh, if there was ever a fantastic opportunity for value engineering, they did it. And this is just really unbelievable. Well, not unbelievable for our staff, 
But in the, in the normal world, it would be just unbelievable to have this kind of engineering going on uh, to find a much better solution that helps everybody. So now we can, uh, we can interchange water with Beaverton and Beaverton with us. And uh, anyway, they should really be proud of themselves for doing that. And I just, uh, I was just, well, for lack of a better word, flabbergasted at how subtle they were. They didn't blow a trumpet or anything, uh, but this is really cool. It's the kind of thing we need to have happen. And I was, I was really, uh, really taken by it. And, uh, uh, you know, so anyway, you just need to understand how incredibly clever the staff is. And uh, I, this goes throughout the district. Uh, we had a discussion today at the uh, Aloha Business Association. And what I told the people there was that you only assemble a staff like this once in your lifetime. Oh, wow. and, uh, and there we are. So I just want you to understand uh, what a great thing we've got going here. And I'll shut up now. Commissioner Dunk, your words mean so much to me and um, my staff. I, I know that they all um, appreciate your um, your words very much. And I am very sorry for my dog who's outside barking at me. Um, but <laughs> the, we will we will come to board probably at one of our um, department updates and give a more detailed highlight of what we ended up doing. Um, at this pump station and how we were able to take lemon and um, make lemonade out of it. Sweet, sweet lemonade. It's not done yet, but we're pretty sure that it's going to taste very, very good going down. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions with that? Without any more questions? I'm going to invite um, Dave Kraska, our Willamette Water Supply Program Director, to provide his update next. Thank you, Carrie. So, folks, um, and, and uh, good evening, uh, TVWD Budget Committee members and board members. It's been about uh, 42 minutes by my count uh, since our last break. Um, do you all want to take another quick break, or should I press on? Well, I would say press on, and I would also say that I feel really sorry for you batting last at the <laughs> end of a two-hour meeting. But if anybody can handle it, you can. You've always got the best picture. <laughs> Although Carrie had some darn good ones, I gotta say. <laughs> yeah, Carrie. I'm Carrie's... trying. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Carrie's got great material to work with. Um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm very very lucky to have really cool stuff to show too and and really big numbers that we're working with this time so um so if the interest is in pressing on let's press on i am going to try to take control as paul says of the meeting and um let's see how that goes so far so good i can click one slide ahead and that's me dave Kraska, what willamette water supply program director talking about the water supply program department so first slide, Water Supply Program Department Operating Budget. Um, the graph on the right uh, might look familiar. It's similar to the one that I presented to you at our last meeting back in March. Shows our operating budget um, since the uh, couple past bienniums and looking ahead to our next biennium, you see it go down a little bit. I'll explain that in the next chart on the next slide. But there's a couple of positions, three positions actually, that we're not going to fill. And so that's the savings there. But really, over the next biennium, we expect to complete design work and related activities, meaning that uh, when I come to present to you, if everything goes well in two years, we will not be doing any more design work and anything related to it. Um, we will also initiate and advance 16 construction projects and continue planning for operations and system integration. So it will be a busy time for us. There we are. So uh, here is the one simple chart that I have for you about our spend for the water supply program department 
uh, summary by appropriation category. And uh, really just two main categories here to present to you. Personnel services is our main one on the program. And as it shows there that uh, in this requested budget for the next biennium, it's down about $800,000 from the prior, uh, by, by prior budget. And that is largely because there are three positions that we intended or, or anticipated filling in the last biennium, and we found they were not needed or that we, we were going to be able to safely hold off on them. And that's what we intend to do for this biennium as well. Materials and services, really no main change there. And so that's the budget uh, for the department program or the, the department summary there, about $4 million. So the rest of the budget, rest of the presentation really to you tonight is about our capital improvements funds. And so as a contrast, what we what I presented to you at our last meeting on March 23rd was about the water supply program. That's our department 60. Um, that's the uh, TVWD staff involved in uh, delivering the WIF and the WWSS. So that's the water supply program. So my team that's delivering that uh, all the work there. And so tonight's presentation is about the Willamette intake facilities, our so fund 44. Going to give you the over overview and status of that and the planned activities um, and budget for the next biennium for those facilities and then also the willamette water supply system or fund 45 and the same level of detail on that one um, i'll be explaining what i mean by those two now because it is easy to confuse unless you live it like i do first off a little reminder about our program mission and I'll just read it out loud because it's been an awesome mission. It's been it's been an excellent guide to us in everything that we do. And it is to provide a cost-effective, reliable, and resilient water supply system by July 2026. There is a hard deadline to everything that we're doing uh, that benefits current and future generations of the communities we serve and supports a vibrant local economy. And as a reminder, um, good governance here in that we're doing this project, this massive infrastructure project with two partners, the cities of Hillsborough and Beaverton, and that is efficient and saves money for all involved. So what is the WIF and the WWSS? Well, you've seen this uh, graphic a number of times um, in these meetings, and overall the infrastructure that we're building is the Willamette River intake, which is located in Wilsonville. Actually, we're expanding the existing intake. We're building a new state-of-the-art water treatment plant in, in just outside of Sherwood. More than 30 miles of large diameter transmission pipeline and water storage tanks up on Cooper Mountain, simply shown in this graphic here on the right. And so when I talk about the Willamette intake facilities, this flag that just popped up shows where those are located. It's just facilities located right at the Willamette River, and I've got some slides to remind you what that, what that entails. And the Willamette water supply system is the infrastructure that essentially is everything else. So everything that's not Willamette intake facilities is the Willamette water supply system. They're distinct, uh, different, uh, but they are integral to each other. One can't function without the other. So a thing to note is uh, at the beginning of this presentation is that capital spend will dramatically increase in the next few years. This is, uh, Tom um, alludes it from time to time as the event horizon. It's really, it's really the peak of the spending curve. And so when I click again there, this biennium that we're talking about is really the peak of this cash flow curve. I should have noted that this cash flow curve that I'm showing you, those blue bars, that, uh, that, you know, that increase in time over there, that's our spend per fiscal year. And then the, the curve that you see um, is the total spend, the cumulative spend over time, uh, going up to a peak of $1.3 billion. So um, there's a lot of influencers um, involved in, in getting, in challenging us getting this work done and helping us getting this work done. And it includes demand on a program, partner agency, staff and resources, so folks like um, Carrie and her team are involved in everything that we're doing so that when we hand the keys over to them, they know what they're working on. Um, we're relying on outside partners to, for delivering our projects. We're doing a lot of partner projects with Washington County as they're building roadways in certain areas. We want to partner up with them and build our pipeline at the same time so we impact the community only once. But that takes a, a lot of effort in terms of giving up some control of our work, aligning our work with them, marrying our projects together. It's a big task. Similarly, there's some significant electrical demands or electrical loads that we're adding to the system in Sherwood and down at the Willamette River. So that's a lot of coordination with PGE and have them perform when we need to. 
Uh, there's effects on stakeholders with all of this work, obviously with the ratepayers, everything that we're talking about tonight. Um, also a lot of effects on property owners and businesses where we need to acquire land for our work. Um, certainly a lot of our work is going to be incurring in roadways uh, are going to be impacted. For, so that's going to impact motorists, pedestrians, cyclists. Um, and it's a challenging economic climate, as you've heard from Paul and Tom earlier today. There's going to be a lot of competition for regional construction resources, and COVID-19 has, has, has really challenged the economy. And this is really a, uh, an unfortunate confluence, is that, is that you would think with a challenged economy, the construction activity would go down. But actually, we're seeing there's still a, quite a demand for construction activity. So even though with economic challenges, there's still a significant competition for regional construction resources. Um, we hey, still have a Marilyn. Oh. Yes. This, this is Marilyn. I just want to ask a question. Uh, when you talk about the WWSS and WIF cost, is that just to us, or is that counting, you know, to the cost to Beaverton and uh, other partners? So I'm going to start answering. Thank you for your question, and thank you for just interrupting me. I think I think that's that's perfect because otherwise I'm just going to go on <laughs> through all of my slides. So. <laughs> So, so so jump in and I'm going to start answering and then I'm going to ask Paul to help out. But but everything that I'm showing you in my slides here is is the costs for everything, um, not just for TVWD, but it's, it is for it is for building all of this stuff. And then and that as TVWD is the managing agency for appropriating all these funds and then TVWD gets reimbursed by the partners. And so, Paul, how did I do or what did I miss? You did great. You missed nothing. Uh, so <laughs> I'm learning. OK, so did that answer your question? That did. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for asking again. Uh, let's see. So um, uh, I was uh, talking about there's still a lot of approvals and properties that we still need to acquire in this current year, uh, a lot of permits and approvals. Uh, dozens of easements remain to be acquired, and there's risk for opportunistic behaviors. And what do we mean by that? Well, when somebody understands we need their property, it might mean that they might try to slow us down in order to get a better offer from us. And uh, with dozens of properties to acquire, it's a big task to get through all of that, but we're working our way through it. And then finally, and then it's it's remains an environment of continual change. You heard a lot about this from from Tom earlier in the in the presentation tonight. As much as we have everything planned, there are still things that will crop up that we need to address and need to pivot and and attack. We do it all the time, and we'll continue doing it all the way through the program. So. Um, Every year on the program, we update the costs and schedule for the WWSS and the WIF, the Willamette Supply System and the Willamette Intake Facilities. And in evaluating the costs and schedule, we're tracking to make sure we're, we're on track to meet our mission, which is to be complete and delivering water by June or July 2026. And we call our costs and schedule our baseline. So it's uh, so through this uh, presentation here tonight, we we're talking about baseline 6.1. It's the sixth baseline that we've that we've developed for the program. And the baseline includes the master schedule, the cost estimate uh, to build everything, and then the partner cost estimate, cost share estimates, what each of the partners. Um, and this is all tied together by the mission of delivering the WWSS and ancillary and the ancillary projects that I'll speak to in a moment. So um, why do we adopt a baseline and when? Well, we have to. It's part of the IGA in terms of the board is required, the WWSS board is required to adopt a capital improvement plan. And right now we're using the baseline as the capital improvement plan. Um, it's also a component of the WWSS financial procedures uh, in, in the IGA exhibit six. It's also part of our governance plan. And, it's up, and when do we do it? It's updated annually and modified if needed. And then how is it used? How do we use the baseline in the program? Well, we use it for planning and managing our work to make sure we're on track, for establishing fiscal year budgets like we're talking about tonight, uh, detecting potential changes or variances, basically monitoring on time whether we're on track or not, uh, getting input uh, to our risk analysis and management, uh, reporting to outside parties such as the board or partners or WIFIA, meaning the EPA, and to the public and also provides input to financial forecasting by the partners. By being able to forecast and track our spend, we're able to tell our, our partners um, how to manage, how to plan for those, uh, those expenses. 
So um, how do we go about preparing the annual baseline and reviewing it? Well, it starts in December uh, where the program, my team, uh, prepares the initial draft that we give to the partners and in, in the various committees to review and comment on. And then the program addresses those comments, prepares the updated draft, and then by March, typically, it goes to the management committee for consideration and whether it can be recommended to the board for approval, which happens in April. This year, however, we got stuck in a little bit of a do loop um, between the partners receiving the draft and the program addressing the comments and then back to the partners and so on. And the reason we did that is because, as you've heard from Paul and Tom earlier in the presentation, revenues are suffering pandemic related challenges. The cost of increase since baseline 5.2, our last approved baseline, uh, the costs have gone up about $40 million with the draft baseline six. And we have to acknowledge also that all of the design will design will be done. As you heard me say, say earlier, we will be out of the design business in about a year. And that means this is our very last opportunity to make significant changes before everything is in construction. Once you go out to bid and you sign all those construction contracts, it's very difficult to modify anything and really make any significant changes. And finally, as you also heard from, from Tom and Paul early in this presentation, substantial risk of cost escalation remains. There are risks out there that we need to we need to manage to uh, to control our costs, and um, it's a risk for us that we need to we need to address. So, how do we go about managing cost and schedule risk related to baseline 6.1? Well, we took a hard look at everything that we're doing on the program, and we asked ourselves, where can we cut? Where can we reduce? Because what we're trying to achieve, we're trying to establish is some, some breathing room there between our, our projected costs and the funding available so that if something were to happen, we can still stay within the funding availability. And we evaluated a bunch of different options ranging from anywhere from $30 million cost reduction to $170 million cost reduction in the projected spend through 2026. And what we found through this exercise is that um, well, let me bring bring up the next one. Well, in evaluating these options of the cutting between 30 to 170 million, we needed to balance maintaining the mission of the WWSP, which means again, finishing by 2026, delivering water where needed by 2026, uh, with the current financial realities that we're dealing with. So ultimately, uh, what what uh, TVWD and its partners, Hillsborough and, T and uh, Beaverton, agreed to. It's a limited number of changes to reduce the spend through 2026 by about $50 million while still delivering water again by June of 2026. So we still meet our mission, but we found a way to reduce the spend by $50 million. And how did we do that? Well, one of the things we're going to do is defer one of the two reservoirs on the top of Cooper Mountain. Uh, we found by doing that, we save, we save on a, around $17 million maybe a little bit more than that, but it was a good chunk of that $50 million. We're also going to defer most of what we call our PLW 2.0 project. That's our pipeline project in Cornelius Pass Road that goes from Francis up to Highway 26. There's a part of that pipeline that we have to build because it's in an environmentally sensitive area. It's also some property negotiations that have been challenging. We want to get that tough part of the project done and out of the way but the balance of that project is going to be deferred and that saves us another big chunk of money. And then finally, there's some other deferrals, some, some minor um, elements of the water treatment plant, uh, completing the fiber optic network north of the water treatment plant and again, some staff positions. Uh, all of that will be pushed out in time, uh, completed in the future. And ultimately all of these things uh, cut our spend through 2026 by about $50 million. So, the next major parts of my presentation are to get into uh, the, the anticipated capital spend for the Willamette intake facilities and the Willamette water supply system. So first off, we'll get into the Willamette intake facilities. I got some slides here to remind everyone what are the Willamette intake facilities. Uh, this photo right here is a, is a drone shot looking towards the Willamette River that you see in the background in that. Uh, and this is of the Willamette River Water Treatment Plant down in Wilsonville. So you see the treatment plant there, the, the, the treatment plant park uh, just to the right of the treatment plant. And then the little flag there that comes up there, the location symbol, that is where the uh, Willamette intake facilities are located right down by the river. So if we look at a plan view of those same facilities, 
The dashed line that you see pop up there just on the right shows where the Willamette intake facilities are. It's the raw water pump station and then a pipeline and the intake screens that extend out into the river. I think I've, you've seen a lot of these before, so I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. Uh, this uh, image here is a uh, is a graphic that shows what the Willamette intake facilities, the raw water pump station intake screens and the intake pipeline that connects them uh, look like in section or or in profile. And it shows just how those lay out um, where we have the intake screens in the river, the intake pipeline through the through the soil, the bank, and then extending into the uh, raw water pump station. In the real world, in the physical world, this is what the intake screens looked like when they were first installed in the Willamette River. Uh, all of the, uh, the, the intake screens and the intake pipeline that they were connected to was all built on a barge and then it was submerged uh, in the Willamette River and set in place. In this project, what we're doing with the with the with the expansion project is we are replacing those screens. Those blue big blue screens you see there um, are sized for a capacity of 72 million gallons a day. We will be replacing with them with larger screens that have a capacity of 150 million gallons a day. This is a photo uh, looking at the interior of the raw water pump station. The thing to note here is this is also kind of where we start separating the Willamette intake facilities from the Willamette water supply system. So what you see here in gray essentially is the pump station structure itself and the floor of the pump station structure. Below that is the caisson where the, where the, the water from the Willamette River is pumped out of. And so all of the gray uh, things that you see there are part of the Willamette intake facilities. The blue equipment there, which are the motors and the pumps and the piping, that's actually part of the existing Willamette River water treatment plant. We will be installing our raw water pumps for the Willamette water supply system in the same pump station. You can see the, the blank uh, pump uh, supports. There are pump pads in the background there. We'll be installing our pumps in there, and that'll be the beginning of the Willamette water supply system will be the pumps. Um, another component of the Willamette intake facilities is the air burst system that's used to clean the screens. And basically, there's three main components of that. It's the compressors that, that draw in the ambient air and force that, compress it into the receiver tank. And then we have air burst valves that after we have the receiver tank filled with compressed air, the air burst valves rapidly open, sending that compressed air out to the screens and back flushing out anything that is collected onto the screens. So upgrading the Willamette intake facilities is part of the WWSP's raw water facilities project. And so I've got some flags to click up here and they're kind of going out of order here a little bit, but it includes replacing, I should, show, I should explain. This graphic you're looking at here is again, the, an aerial view of the Willamette River water treatment plant and park and the upper facilities over to the, on the, on the left side of this graphic this is the engineering drawing that we're using for all of uh, all the improvements that are currently in construction right now. We're replacing the fish screens, as I mentioned. We're doing seismic improvements for the caisson and the pump building. We're doing air burst system improvements. All of those uh, flags there are for the Willamette intake facilities. And then for the WWSS, the Willamette water supply system, we have the raw water pipeline in the electrical duct bank. The flag's already up there. We have the mechanical pump, the mechanical pump station upgrade. So again, installing those pumps and other equipment in there. And then one more is the standby power surge control and upper site electrical building. Again, up on that upper site separate from the water treatment plant. And the uh, all of the electrical gear there is to power, to energize the pumps that we have down on the raw water pump station. So uh, for all of that, for everything at the, uh, at the raw water facilities project, it's about a $110 million uh, project for construction, 108 million, uh, 766,000 and so on. Uh, of that, about 10% is related to the Willamette intake facilities. So as I mentioned, replacing the screens, uh, doing the seismic upgrades to stabilize the raw water pump station and so on, that's about $11 million. The balance, about $98 million, is everything else related to the uh, Willamette Water Supply System share. It's a two-phase project, the Raw Water Facilities Project. Um, we have completed the design phase and the construction of phase one is underway. Um, it started in uh, uh, the second quarter of 2020 
and we're expecting it to end a little less than a year from now in, in Q1 of 2022. Um, all of the, the work that we're doing in phase one is the below ground work. So replacing the, the uh, screens, uh, stabilizing the soil by the, uh, by the raw water pump station, installing the raw water pipeline foundation for the uh, upper site facilities and so on. Construction of phase two um, is uh, all the above ground uh, construction and equipping of all the facilities that we're constructing there. And that we're anticipating starting in the Q3, which is still part of the biennium that we're speaking of tonight. Got some photos there of the work that's uh, underway right now. Um, on the left-hand side is the mass excavation that was uh, performed at the upper site. There was about 50,000 cubic yards of material there that was basically spoiled that needed to be off-hauled to create the construction pad for our upper facilities. On the right-hand side is the photo of the completed foundations, really, for the upper facilities. There's uh, something short of 300 uh, piles that have been installed, installed up on that site uh, to seismically support the uh, facilities that we're planning to construct there in phase two. Uh, the current activities uh, down near the river, so in, the, in these two photos you see the river there in the background uh, and you see uh, some, some, of the, uh, some of the highlighted uh, elements here. Uh, the, the square structure there is again our, our, uh, our uh, raw water pump station and then we have a batch plant which creates the, the mixture of materials that we use for the deep soil mixing to stabilize the soil in the area. So again, when the, when the earthquake happens, we don't want that soil moving out to the river and taking our raw water pump station to it. We need it to stay in place. And we found the most economical way to do that was to by improving the soil in situ, so in its location. And so we do that using deep soil mixing technology by mixing a lot of the soil, bulk of the soil with a cementitious material to strengthen it. And then also through jet grouting. So it's a similar sort of process, but we can do it at an angle and do be a little bit more precise with it. And so by mixing the two technologies, we are getting all of the benefits at the lowest cost. Um, there, uh, this process though, jet grouting and deep soil mixing does generate a lot of waste that needs to be managed carefully. So it doesn't end up in the Willamette River or anywhere else we don't want it. And so there's a lot of environmental protection that goes and that takes place as we're doing our construction activities here. And these two photos here, one the drone shot on the left hand side and then the shot of the actual activity where where the worker is is taking the spoils handling from the deep soil mixing process and putting it in the drying bed uh, before it's off halt so um, on the upper site we have more activity occurring there uh, we're doing our trenchless uh, crossing launching and receiving shaft so um, there's uh, as you approach the the uh, water treatment plant, you cross over Arrowhead Creek. Um, our pipeline is going to have to cross underneath Arrowhead Creek, and we're going to do that using a trenchless technology. We looked at going open trench through Arrowhead Creek, but we found that that was too too much of an environmental impact. And so the best way to go about that one, we found this in this particular case was to go trenchless. And so there's a lot of work to get prepared for that. Uh, still more foundation work occurring and then coordinating for the raw water pump station seismic work. Oh, well, that's OK. Pretty much finished that graphic. So on to the WIF biennium budget activities. So how much money are we talking about here for the next biennium? So if we look at our Gantt chart and what's at, what's taking place, uh, we remember this is a two phase construction project and the red dashed line there shows you what's occurring in the biennium. It's the end of phase two and the begin, uh, the end of phase one and the beginning of phase two. So again, construction of phase one started in Q2 of 2020, will end in Q1 of 2022. And that is our ground stabilization work. So wrapping up the ground stabilization work, doing the intake screens replacement and doing the pump station seismic retrofit. All of that will occur in this biennium. Uh, regarding phase two, that one starts in Q3 of 2022 and ends in Q4 of 2024. So we get about maybe a third of the way through phase two in this biennium. And in that period for the WIF, we will be doing the airburst system improvements and some building mechanical improvements. And so what does all that cost? Their numbers are here. So in this chart, we show the total capital outlay, the total uh, capital spend for that work of about $6.5 million. 
of that. Uh, we project that TVWD's uh, portion will be about $3.1 million, and that means the other partners have a spend of about $3.4 million. Moving on now to the Willamette water supply system. So remember the earlier graphic I showed, the Willamette intake facility is just at the very bottom of the infrastructure and the Willamette water supply system is everything else. And so this is a, a graphic that is easy, best found, the, the most up-to-date version on the website, ourreliablewater.org. And so you can go to that website and get the latest version of this graphic that shows our, our entire water supply system network all the different projects and a lot of useful information about those projects, including some, some facts and figures and also timing of those projects. When I made this presentation to you, this group, uh, two years ago, um, I showed you a graphic that looked like that. this. And this is our project delivery progress that we update monthly. On the left-hand side, we show all of, our, all of our work packages, all the various projects that make up the WWSS that we're completing. And across the top, it shows the different stages of those projects, whether we're in conceptual or preliminary design, up to 100% design, or whether it's in construction or completed. So some of the projects that you see all the way out in construction and they have the dark green bars, those are completed construction projects. And they're just waiting to be put in service once everything else is completed. But during in spring of 2019, you can see that everything was done with conceptual design, and then we're moving into various levels of completion of the design work. Now, two years later, you can see that we're, again, as I've said before, we're almost done with design. Almost all of our projects are in, into 100% design. Just a couple of projects are still being wrapped up, including PLM 1.3, which is one of our pipeline projects in the uh, city of Wilsonville, and MPE 1.3, which is our, which is the, the project uh, uh, chief engineer Kerry Pack referred to as far as the Metzger Pipeline East project. That's a pipeline in Shoals Ferry Road, going from about Roy Rogers Road out to about, um, well, just short of the 217 crossing. Um, and we have more projects in construction now. You can see we have one, two, three, four, five projects in construction uh, per this graphic. And more projects completed construction too. So um, this is uh, another piece of information you can get by going to ourreliablewater.org that it shows a simplified version of our Gantt chart of all of the projects that we have on the left-hand side and when those projects occur. And if I bring up this uh, dashed line, you can see where we are in time. A lot of work has been completed and all the work uh, that's to be completed, again, is a different color, meaning that we're heading into the full-on uh, uh, construction phase of the program. So what are we talking about budget for these activities? Well, again, look at our Gantt chart, and then we draw the line around our Gantt chart like this to identify all the activities that are occurring uh, in this time frame. It's a pretty useful uh, tool that we rely on quite a bit. And so if we look at the WWSS work for, plan for this biennium, um, the, the most obvious uh, things that we're doing are completing the design of seven projects uh, and advancing construction of 16 projects. In addition, inside the program, we are also continuing our program management activities, which include WIFIA compliance and loan payments, our safety program, our communications and outreach program, uh, development of our financial procedures. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of uh, acquisitions we need to go through, including real estate permits and land use approvals to move our projects forward and a lot of planning as well. Uh, we're planning for water supply integration so that when we actually turn off, turn on the supply to the existing distribution systems, it goes smoothly. Everyone knows what to do and it's, um, and it's managed properly. Um, along with that is our overall commissioning and startup plans and our operations plans uh, for uh, taking over the, uh, the operational facilities. So to do all of that over the next biennium, we're looking at a spend of about $452 million. So again, this was this is the steep part of the curve, as Tom alluded to the event horizon on the program. We're here. Uh, TVWD's portion of this is about $242 million. All the other partners, about $210 million, again, for that total of $452 million. If we pull it all together, the WIF, the WWSS, and MPE, um, again, WIF, about $6.5 million, WWSS, $452 million. 
The Metzger Pipeline East project, again, that's an ancillary project or a partner or a project, a TVWD project that's being done through the program. And then the next biennium, we're anticipating a spend of about $83 million for an all-in biennial budget for the, at, the, uh, at the program of about $542 million. And this is always um, a good news slide to end on. Where is all that money going? Well, the good news is a lot of it's going locally. Um, to date, uh, local spend, as I've reported to you before, about 94%. Uh, quite frankly and honestly, we expect that number to go down um, as we move into more of the facilities construction, like the water treatment plant. We're going to be acquiring a lot of um, a lot of equipment and materials that are going to be from uh, not within this area. They're going to be in areas outside. And so we're going to see that number trend down a bit, but um, we've sized our projects and we're bidding our projects so that local contractors can can be they can be they can be awarded to local contractors. Been very successful at that to date, and we anticipate remaining successful uh, going forward. And with that, I would be glad to um, take any of your questions. Can you hear everybody, you hear everybody counting, counting to eight? To eight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I shared that little uh, that little rule with everyone. everyone I know, seems to it's, like, it's the Kraska rule. <laughs> yeah, it is, it's helpful to have something to go by. It's like, well, how long should I wait? So eight seconds is usually a good rule. If no one uh, unmutes their mic in about eight seconds, um, we're probably good for now. But um, I'm sure this isn't the last time people are going to are going to have an opportunity to ask me questions about this massive budget. Um, but I'd be glad to uh, um, answer them at any time. And I think with that, I think the presentation goes back to uh, to Paul Matthews. Thank you, Dave. Uh, well, I don't know if uh, I've been hoisted on my own petard or if I've uh, been clever by half, but my goal was to give Carrie and Dave the much vetted right at the end of the day presentation and then I would escape, but I guess I am going to have to come back here at the end and close things off. Um, so I, I just a couple things we want to do before uh, we bid everybody good night and we do want to do that quickly. Uh, future workshop, just remind you, our third workshop uh, will be April 22nd. Uh, it'll start at six o'clock and then our formal budget committee meeting uh, where we actually uh, deliberate will be on the 25th. So I'd like to see if there are any questions for the team, any research projects that you uh, would like us to do between now and the next meeting. I do have the one question that President Bagnell asked, and that will be very simple to answer because we've got those numbers uh, available. But are there any other questions from first the Budget Committee? And then I know we have a member of the public here, and I'll ask for questions from them in just a bit. See no questions from the budget committee. Uh, we do have a member of the public, and if you do have a question, if you could uh, use the Teams feature to raise your hand, our district quarter, uh, Debbie Carper, will um, flip the switch that makes, uh, makes you available to uh, answer your question. So if you do have one, please raise your hand. See no questions. Uh, that wraps up staff's presentation for tonight. And again, we'll see you in two weeks on the 22nd. And President Bagnell, I'll turn the meeting back over to you. Thank you. And let me apologize. My earbuds died. I, I ran out of juice. And so now I've got earplugs in and, and I seem to have an echo. And I hope that nobody else is echoing. Budget committee members, I want to thank you all again for your attendance, for your attention, and thank you so much to the staff. Really great, great information as always. And and again, my special appreciation for getting the materials a day in advance. That was most helpful. Okay, either everybody's asleep or you did such a swell job. There are no more questions. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs> so I'm going to adjourn the meeting and thank you all. <laughs>